This is another episode of Thursday's Lessons, wherein I attempt to impart some new information on you based on history, nerdery, or anything combining the two. Today, on our Thursday's Lessons, we're going to jump right into the nerd aspect of this show, where I'm going to draw some lessons from some more nerdy sources, in particular a little game called Persona 4, which, for people who have you know, been in this channel before and have seen any other videos of mine or anything, you know that I draw my theme music from that game. In particular, a piece called I'll Face Myself. Just remember that because that'll be really important throughout this show, that theme right there. Just keep that in mind for now. But to start, based on the title of this show, you might have, if you're familiar with the game at all, a few ideas of where I'm going to go with this. But Assuming that you don't know, to give you a quick idea of what the Fog of Illusion is in the game context, it's basically a metaphor for people's unwillingness to accept the truth of themselves, of the world around them, of what's happening, everything basically, of reality. The Fog of Illusion is basically society's desire to see the world as what they want it to be rather than what it is. And in that game, it takes on a very literal context as a fog that basically threatens to bring about the end of the world in a form. Now, spoilers ahead, by the way, for the for Persona 4. I'm going to be talking about a lot of the end material because that's where the relevant parts of my point come in. So just be warned, spoilers ahead. The fog basically threatens to overcome the real world, our world, and basically turn everybody into these creatures that are living in their own reality entirely. Imagine everybody getting their own bubble of perceptive reality where whatever you want to be true is what seems to be true and you don't have to be bothered with the unpleasant details of reality anymore at all. See, this, this sounds eerily like you are not describing anything fantasy-oriented at all, but is just a description of reality. And that's the point. See, that's, as a side note, why I love the Shin Megami games, is they always have a social commentary that's snuck in there, but at the same time blatant, once you think about it. And in this case, what they're discussing here is a general social tendency, as you noted, that's very real, to ignore reality and the truth of what is in favor of comfortable illusions. It's we, we as atheists are aware of this on an individual basis just all the time. It's what we deal with in multiple contexts from various different people is just things like confirmation bias yep. and uh, the rationalizations people make in order to maintain their current worldview. And Blind faith is one of the pillars of this idea. Mm -hmm. And you see it in religion. Now, it doesn't have to be. You can have, you know... I, I was thinking of conspiracy theorists. Yes. That's what I was thinking of that whole time. I wasn't even thinking in a religious context because it's everybody for Everywhere. multiple different reasons. Yeah. Even the same person for different reasons in different contexts and such. Well, it's the bystander effect, right? That's another example of it. The idea that when somebody sees something happening that is bad, right, rather than intervene, they think, well, there's somebody else that'll take care of this. There, there, there are people for that. Um, somebody's going to call the police, and they don't do anything. Because rather than get involved, they create this idea in their head that there's just somebody else that will take care of it, and they don't have to deal with it. Pretending that they don't have responsibility by diffusing the responsibility. Exactly. And it's not an active mental process. No, it's not like this, usually at least, it's not like the person's actually like a, just a bad person or anything, but it's a social and mental flaw that we as humans all suffer from it's to just, varying degrees. This is part of just the lubrication of what gets us through our social situations in yeah. general, the same way that white lies do. Exactly. You don't it's, tell your mom what you're thinking about when you're sitting on the toilet type shit. Right, and it is in moderation, right? a social lubricant. To a point, there's such a thing as compassion fatigue. There's such a thing as caring too much about too many things and then th being unable to do anything about any one issue. Mm -hmm. There is such a thing as too much, and you do have to sort of limit your empathy in this world to be sane. But 
then there's taking it way the hell too far, which is when you simply pretend that the world's problems aren't what they are. It's when you look at homelessness and say, oh, well, they just need to get a job. Ignoring completely the reality that makes that nigh unto impossible for most of these people, whether due to simple, the homelessness itself preventing them from being hireable to mental illness or trauma, any number of things that could be the, the real reason why they don't have a job, but it's blithely dismissed by this, oh, they could just get a job and choose not to illusion that I'll tell myself so I don't have to feel guilt about their situation. It's an inevitability that there will be homeless people, but I don't want to deal with that. No, because I'd rather believe that they don't have to be homeless and tell myself to sleep at night, basically, that they could just not be homeless. They're lazy. So because they're lazy, I don't have to feel guilty about their situation or think about it because it's their fault, clearly. The responsibility is put on them instead of being on us to orient our society in such a way that we don't require homeless people just to survive. Right. And see, this hits every angle and every piece of our culture and society where look at the votes for Donald Trump. How many people voted for him based on things that any expert could tell you? No, that is completely untrue, impossible, slash he won't do that, slash whatever. And how many people were sitting there saying, oh, well, he'll drain the swamp and whatever, despite the fact that he is probably our most corporate aligned president ever. And people somehow thought he was going to be a populist president. And yet people are still popularly gaslighting the rest of us, telling us to give him a chance when he's giving us every chance to judge him precisely the way we had expected him to act. Exactly. But there are people that look at that and say, no, nah, I think he's on point. How do you do that beyond a powerful illusion on yourself where you simply are refusing to look at what is in front of you? Well, the clip that went viral of that Trump voter uh, saying that I believe that California allows people to vote fraudulently, basically. And the anchor is just smacking her forehead yeah. like, you believe that it's legal for people to illegally vote. Yeah. But that's the thing. Look at any... You did a wonderful thing bringing up conspiracy theory earlier. Because... Further than religion, further than almost any other facet of the human condition, that is what illustrates it so bluntly, is the conspiracy theorist, because they are looking at what are basically objective facts and reinterpreting reality to fit a narrative that makes them feel better. Literally, at that point, you are looking at, look at a, you know, Obama birther. They're looking at the birth certificate and then saying, well, no, actually, there's a long-form birth certificate that must exist because this literally cannot be the answer because that would make my worldview invalid. So there, I have to find a way to invalidate this document regardless of its truth. Oh, well, it's not the right birth certificate. So it, it's still not, it doesn't count. That is reality revision, literally. When someone can look at something and say, well, I need evidence for this. They hand you the evidence and you go, well, actually... This isn't the right kind of evidence anymore. No. Your evidence doesn't work because it doesn't meet my exact specification that I failed to mention previously. Because it didn't exist until you produced the evidence that I didn't believe could exist. It's... Uh, Moving the goalposts. Yes. It's revisionist thinking. Where when something... Let's say you have somebody in the fog, right? And suddenly somebody, a more well-informed person, challenges an ignorant statement they make. This happens so often to people in the atheist community or different communities, the feminist community, oh my God, um, where you make a statement of fact against somebody's incorrect assertion. And rather than accepting your fact or anything, you know, rather than saying, hey, I don't believe this, but let me do my own research, something that is reasonable, more often than not, you'll get the response of, your facts are wrong because I don't like where they came from. But that's a legitimate fact that has been studied like a hundred times over. You can't just ignore it because you don't like it. Yes, I can, and I will. That's the fog at work right there when you can look at an objective fact and say I don't like this so it doesn't count if you ever saw the movie or read the book uh, the short story rather by Stephen King The Mist hmm. 
When those people, when you're in that helpless situation, you're the one person there who's making sense, but everyone else has gone insane with, they're just, they've gone mad. If it's mass hysteria, fueled by this religious zealot, and you're the only one who makes sense, but suddenly you're the one who's insane and persecuted. That's Parts. exactly what yeah. we're talking about. It's this basic human failing that has gone throughout history. Oh, it's existed since civilization, probably. Like, this idea that consensus equals reality. That my opinion trumps your facts. Yes. It's that on a wider scale. Exactly. Because, again, we're talking about things at the more individualized level when it comes to confirmation bias, rationalizations, uh, faith, and so on and so forth. But yes. But how it manifests itself on a grander scale is the real problem. Because exactly. that's where you it have has a, a collective voice. You have a society making decisions about its progress based on unreal assumptions. Because individually, you have people who are making these statements about homeless people, you know, choosing to believe ridiculous shit about gay people. Mind you, whatever group you want, whatever conspiracy you want, whatever delusion you want to pick, it's irrelevant because the grander effect becomes that society, with enough of these people believing enough of these various comfortable delusions, are making decisions in aggregate based on unreal information. And they're making decisions about society. What are we doing about homelessness? What are we doing about this problem and that problem based on a fundamentally flawed view of reality that anybody who looks at objective facts can generally disprove. But that's the infuriating part of this is it's not about the facts. It should always be about the facts, but it isn't. Rarely See, is it, actually. It seems nonsensical that you would blindfold yourself in order to avoid walking off cliffs. I mean, well, but it's always more gradual than that. If it was a cliff, yes, most people will back up from a cliff regardless of ideology. But it's almost never a cliff. It's usually an incline, and you're usually rolling down a hill. And in any given moment, you feel like you could regain control. Even while shit tumbles down around you, it's not such an immediate descent that you feel like shit has left your control and no longer could you salvage any good outcome from this. It's always a slow, tumbling freefall that a lot of people can convince themselves can be turned around. And everybody sees it as the small snowball and never sees it turn into a boulder. Well, that's because it never is not, one not single until boulder. until it has turned into one, well, or unless you get hit by it. Exactly. See, it's never one giant boulder, because again, that would draw enough attention. It's the snowball effect of small things, where, you know, it's a swarm of gnats. An individual gnat poses not even barely an annoyance, if you notice it. An entire swarm of gnats that has decided to orbit your face for some particular reason is insufferable. Why? Not because the gnats have become bigger or anything, just because enough of the small things have occurred at once to make it big. A lot of tiny things can become a big thing, even if they're all unrelated. <laughs> That's what microaggressions are, people, yes, by, the, by way. the way. Which is, by the way, another good point to illustrate for this fog, when people simply don't admit that this exists. Microaggressions are like a sociological concept, something that's actually been studied well, and stuff, and people don't believe that they even exist because anti-feminists like to live in However, anti-feminists love to talk about microaggressions and just not call them that. When they talk about assaults on masculinity mm -hmm. and this particular incident, this it, those are microaggressions. They're just not calling them that. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like they all want safe spaces. They just don't call them that. Oh, except Trump, who wants the theater to be a safe space. Literally, he said that, by the way. Um, you know. <laughs> but that's also a part of that fog is cognitive dissonance. The ability to double think. The ability to apply something to yourself and not give it to other people by calling it a different name. Trump has been doing that regularly. Oh, where yeah. he just He says one thing <clears throat> that... like He, in response to him being on the cover of Time... Um, what was it? The Divided States of America yeah. was the subtitle. He was the one saying that, yeah, but I'm the one who's not dividing the country while I'm doing everything to divide the country. It's that, again, 
My actions speak louder than my words. And people live in the fog by listening to the words and yes. just going, yeah, that's that's what makes sense. Well, of course, because, you know, actions do speak louder than words, but words sound pretty. And words are often what we want to hear. <laughs> When somebody says what you want to hear, and there's plenty of studies, if you are curious, you should go Google them. They're very fun to read. Maybe that's subjective. but (laughs) um, Where they talk about the cognitive bias that occurs when somebody says things that agree with you. Where suddenly your opinion of them, in various fields unrelated to what they've even said, improves. Oh, well, he, he said my political views. He echoed them. Well, he he's probably a trustworthy person and I could trust him with money. Also, how just by repetition alone we're made more prone to agreeing with an idea. Yes. You hear an idea more often. There's a part of your brain that sort of herd mentality part that says, oh, I've heard this a lot. This must be the popular opinion. I, I might want to reevaluate that and see if I agree with that. Because everybody else is saying it. The individual human mind is not made to discern truth. It's made to survive, or rather it's just developed however it has arbitrarily. And when you apply that on a wider scale, we're not actually aiming for truth as a society. Well, truth is painful. Truth is hard. It's uncomfortable at the least. Because let's take this... Let's take this back to the co- what started this, Persona 4, right? To illustrate a point about truth and individual level, right? Each character in this game has to face their shadow. The collective repressed feelings and desires, the parts of themselves that they don't want to admit are there. You know, everybody has it. You don't have to admit it here, of course, but I don't I, care if you admit it or not, you have it. I remember when I was uh, younger, and uh, I used to think that I was really nice to girls. No, I wasn't. You have to actually investigate yourself. You have to actually consider, you have to humble yourself, and you have to really it's, change. Well, it's one of the hardest things you can do. And that's the point in the game that they make, you know, sort of metaphor by making each one of these a hard boss fight to, in order to save the character from themselves, basically, is that we do not admit to the truth of even who we ourselves are to ourselves. We think of ourselves as being better than we are. We justify our bad behaviors while refusing to excuse others. We take credit to ourselves that we do not deserve. It's just part of our condition because nobody likes feeling like shit. So we do what we can, consciously or not, to prop ourselves up. It's just a survival instinct, really. You don't get far in life by feeling shitty about yourself all the time. So... But the truth is, the that's a shortcut to feeling good. Because the actual way to actual happiness with yourself and satisfaction, more importantly, is to look at yourself critically for who you are and overcome, well, accept, overcome, and change the parts of yourself that you don't like. It's like looking at yourself honestly and saying, I'm an alcoholic, right, for an example. Like, I'm too lazy. I'm a procrastinator. I'm actually not nice to women, to use your example. I'm trying to be nice, but it's really motivated by my desire to have sex or whatever. It's looking at yourself critically, honestly, and from that third person perspective and saying, this is the truth of who this person in front of me is, the man in the mirror, right? And then rather than sitting down and being depressed about this or giving into it or just accepting it, yeah, that's just me. I'm a selfish bitch, whatever. That it's saying, I can change this. I am the controller of myself. I own my destiny, if nothing else, and can be better than that. And once you do that, you overcome yourself, the, the parts of yourself that you've repressed, you've refused to face. You take them and you say, look, I was a piece of shit about this. I was wrong about X, Y, and Z. I believed bad things, whatever. You can then change that. You can then fix that improve and then rather than having to lie about yourself and simply say oh that that's just not who I am no I never did that you can say yeah that was who I was at one point but I've become better than that and isn't that better honestly to say I've overcome this rather than say oh that never happened 
being simply honest about who you are and being able to take basic pride in being genuine and having integrity as a person. Yeah, it's a, it's a very simple thing. It's complex, but at the same time simple. It is both <laughs> because it all starts with the decision to do it, honestly, and say, yeah, you know, I'm going to stop pretending I don't do this thing. I'm going to stop just justifying my procrastination or, you know, my asshole behavior or my drunkenness or whatever and say, I'm going to honestly evaluate this behavior and then I'm going to start changing it. And see, individually, in the games, each character has to face these aspects of themselves that are very uncomfortable. You know, one character has to face the fact that, you know, a lot of what they're doing, while they claim heroic ambition and want to save everybody, they're really doing it because they're just bored. It's something to do. And here's the thing, though. Both of those points are true. Just because you have a darkness in you doesn't mean that that invalidates the good. And that's sort of the other point. Yes, they, each character had these terrible dark sides to them. But at the same time, that doesn't change what they were doing that was good. That doesn't change the good that they had done or that they thought of, too. See, it's all really a matter of perspective when you look at these things because they're looking at an aspect of themselves that isn't necessarily negative. Like in that example where, oh, I'm just bored and so I'm doing something awesome with my life. Well, right. I have personal fears. I have existential worries about the reasons that I'm doing this. It doesn't change the merit of what they're still doing. It's right. that they have a personal conflict about it. And that does not invalidate the nature of the personal conflict nor its severity. Mm -hmm. It's just society at large has embraced this idea of not facing uncomfortable truths, of not investigating these things deeper. We're very superficial as just a general rule where we evaluate each other and ourselves based on appearances. Do well, I look like a good person? Do I look wealthy? Do I look successful? It's not even about am I successful? Am I wealthy? It's do I appear to be these things? Status has little to do with the actuality of the thing. It's, it's that rule that the military tried to teach me and that I refuse to accept perception is everything but in society as it stands right now perception is everything it's the unfortunate truth it's the fog of illusion literally and it's most disgusting form is that we value the appearance of things over its truth climate change I don't see it happening right now so it must not be real I've got a snowball right here which is the stupidest shit. But to that person, because of the confirmation bias, because of the various logical failures at work, that feels to them as a logical argument. But it could be the actuality of that metaphor of the end of humanity. Yeah, but it's easier to pretend that that's not true than to admit, holy shit, we could die. It's easier to say, no, that can't be true. That's just, that's absurd, no. And play stupid games with it. I'm going to make it into a joke. I don't yeah. really care. I don't care to actually investigate it whatsoever. It's not even that they don't care. They care to not investigate it. Because investigating it is uncomfortable. It, they could face uncomfortable truths. They could have to admit that everything they believed is wrong and that, holy shit, the world is headed for a catastrophe of unimaginable proportions. Wait a minute. Are you saying that most people just don't want to face reality on a fundamental level? That's the whole point of everything I'm saying. Literally. In a nutshell. People are comfortable not being uncomfortable. Obviously. It's a tautology. So, society has said, rather than ripping off the band-aid and letting the wound heal, just leave the band-aid on and it's fine if it becomes a separating mess. It, you don't have to look at it. <laughs> it's not there then. It's covered by a band-aid. do not no. I'm going to get sepsis and die, but I'm not thinking about that. No, you're not. Because we're encouraged to think about the immediate, the right now, and the what's in front of us. Not the ten years later. Because, well, that's uncomfortable. 
Especially, you know, when you have to think about the consequences of all the things that we as a society have done up until this point and then evaluate it honestly, critically, and think about it from the perspective of what are the future generations 100, 200 years from now going to think of what we did? Yeah. <laughs> but we'd rather not think about that. We'd rather really do anything else at all than think about that. Oh, when we get holo when we get holodecks? Huh. I wonder if that'll be the end of us all. Well, then we'll be able to literally live in the fog. Yeah. Well, that is the fog of illusion. If you want to give it its most potent metaphorical form ever, it's the ability to shirk literal all of reality in favor of a world of your devising. It's nothing but play and fantasy. Because, well... Effectively, you know, there is one real world we have right now. Everything else is theoretical. <laughs> so, anything beyond this is part of the fog until you can prove it. But here's the thing. People, you know, like the anti-feminist community versus the feminist community. There's this or the atheist community versus the fundamentally religious community. There's this drive among certain people to educate others, right? And then there are people that will turn back around and say, well, what right do you have to break them from their comfortable illusions, right? You hear this a lot. People say, well, leave the people to their faith, you know? You don't, wh why are you trying to break that? And here's the thing. They, they do a pretty good illustration of this point, I think, at the end of Persona 4. Again, spoilers. Now I'm talking about straight up the real secret ending and stuff, so... <laughs> the end bosses is Izanami. For those unfamiliar with Japanese mythology, this is one of the two founding deities, basically, of the Shinto faith. And she eventually dies, goes in the underworld, and Izanagi, her husband, tries to go into the underworld to bring her back from the dead, but violates some stuff and... You know, it's mythology trying to bring somebody back from the dead. Look at the Orphic myths. You know, it's a whole cool thing there. But to make a long story short, they end up becoming, you know, enemies. Both of them believing what they do, and it's a whole conflict of life versus death, yin and yang in their faith. Anyway, in the game, though, Izanami has basically created the fog of illusion in this whole setup in order to give people their wish, which is no longer having to face reality. They no longer wish to deal with the harsh truths of themselves and each other. It's become basically too much. We just would rather live in a world of lies than look at the truth. And so she's there to give that to us. Bring about the fog, basically turn everybody into the creatures of, you know, mindlessness more or less, that are living in their own personal delusions for as long as they live. And your team is defying this. You're, you're fighting against this. And this point is brought up both by the boss before this, the manifester of the fog, the lesser god created to make it, and Izanami, the architect behind the whole thing, where they both point out you're defying the will of all mankind by doing this. What gives you the right to tell the majority of the world that they can't have what they want? At one point, you know, the uh, Amino Sagiri, the boss who is the basically eyeball of the fog, <laughs> um, he's the one created by Izanami to do all of this, sort of her, you know, minion. Um, his point to you is, you know, the majority of people want this. You're defying it. Can that be just? <laughs> is that justice to defy the will of the majority of life? of mankind, your people. Always back to that Captain America quote, right? The one about planting yourself, like the tree. Yeah. By the river of truth. Mm-hmm. No, you move. Doesn't matter if the world says that something wrong is something right. This is your duty to stand up to it and say no. The majority of people, this is one of the failings of democracy, is this fog. The majority of people say, well, it's in, you know, until very recently, the majority of people said it is fine to completely discriminate against gay people, against bisexuals, against transgender people. This is perfectly acceptable to hurt them, to discriminate against them, deprive them of basic rights. Did that make that right? No. Fuck no. 
Hell no. Even though the majority of people wanted this, it was wrong. <laughs> Doesn't matter how many people want a bad thing, it is still a bad thing. The Aztec Empire flourished on the sacrifice of prisoners, ripping out their hearts, among other things. Was that right, even though the majority of people either wanted it or at least were willing to let it happen? No. Doesn't well, matter. Thursday, don't you know? If everybody says it's okay to kill a baby, hmm. then it's okay. Quick nod to Sean Kennedy's Tales of the After Now. The Killing Game? Look it up if you're curious. Um, basically, a quick point about war and killing. He makes a whole episode of this sort of post-apocalyptic cyberpunk thing debating the philosophy of killing versus murder. And versus survival. death and survival. It's a whole nebulous of topics that are all interlaced and sort of core related to this. Because what's the difference between a war kill and a murder? Beyond when it happens and why. They're both the same thing. Someone has died. Someone has been shot and killed. You can say, oh, well, it was justified. But, ah, see, that's where we get into the, the craziness of this discussion. Because when you say a war is justified, to whom? By whom? And for whom? How do we make that decision? When America says the Vietnam War was justified, there's a lot of people that can offer plenty of disagreement with that statement, including the majority of the Vietnamese. <laughs> And really, that's part of the core of this, is how easy it is for every group of people to think that their view of things is the correct view because they have it. Uh, America believes this. You know, there's the whole thing about, let's take this back to one of my other points of history, right? You know, the other big thing I like to talk about in this, um, which is that, <clears throat> real show now, um, that there's two views of the World War II situation, right? There's the America won everything view and the it was a World War dumbass view. <laughs> one of these is correct. One of these is what the majority of Americans believe. Hint, they're, you know, not the same one. <laughs> because in reality, it was called a World War for a very good reason. Because there were most countries were engaged in war for various reasons. In fact, some of them are completely unrelated to the all-American struggle against the Nazi advancement. Look at Italy's invasion of Africa. Yeah, you almost never even hear about that, right? Italy invaded Africa. And they fought a colonial war with Britain over the African colonies that almost had nothing to do, really, with the actual cause of Nazism. It was a fight over colonial territory between two colonial powers that happened to happen at the same time, basically, as World War II. And yet, there's this entire perception, especially in American culture, that World War II was fought against Japan, Germany, and maybe Italy, depending on who you talk to, and that the whole war was this, America and Britain and a few others versus the Axis powers. It pretty much ignoring the fact that, you know, almost every continent had war on it at this point, over various reasons. What I think of is uh, the thing at the time, propaganda. Yes. Which, what we think of today as propaganda has uh, suddenly come into popular consciousness because of Trump, fake news, post-truth. See, great examples of the fog simply just in new forms. Well, the Democrats are full on in that whole lie of things, right? Where they're, at this point, based on how they treated everything, how they treated, you know, the Hillary issue, all of it, like, they're pretty much uh, pretending that none of what happened happened, that none of why people voted for Trump was real, that nothing that happened in the whole election had the meaning it did. They're almost completely in fantasy land at this point. That was an interesting video I saw is like talking about the idea that there never was a thing as not fake news. Yeah. Propaganda. That's what I mean. Interpretation. We had a war with Cuba over fake news. By the way, yeah, that happened for real. The whole war with Cuba, Roosevelt was in it, a bunch of stuff happened. Yeah, look it up. Um 
where that whole war basically happened over the sinking of a ship that, well, probably blew up on its own. Sort of like, you know, the sinking of the Lusitania in World War One, right? People said, oh my god, the Lusitania innocent cruise liner ship, and the Germans the whole time alleged, hey, that was carrying arms and armaments, thus making it a valid target of war. Later, they found the Lusitania, and it was filled to the brim with weapons and ammo. Holy shit, the Germans were totally right. They blew up a legitimate target of war because it was transporting weapons and ammunition to the front lines. And we had hidden that in a cruise liner. Who's the bad guy on that one, really? <laughs> we tried to use civilians to protect a military transport. Yeah. Perception is not reality. It History repeats itself. Always. And because, again, this is a foundational human problem. And so... What do we take from this, right? What's the point of all of this? Is that, personally, each of us are accountable to the truth. Beyond society, beyond everything else, each one of us personally is accountable to the truth as we can grasp it. That doesn't mean that you are going to be omniscient. You can still be wrong, which is also a very important part to remember, that you might not be deluded. You can simply be misinformed. There's... Lots of things that factor into this, but the point is that you have to be willing to admit, for whatever reason, that you are wrong, that you are capable of being wrong, that your most deeply held beliefs and opinions could be wrong. Maybe they're not. And if you've done a lot of research so far, they might not be. But to say that I know the absolute truth is the first step to falling into the fog of lies, because nobody can know the absolute truth. It is impossible. None of us are omniscient. None of us are perfect. None of us are anywhere near that, and all of us are far more ignorant than we probably believe ourselves to be. And if you start from that idea that the more I learn, the less I know, then you can know that you'll never stop learning. And you can never stop learning if you want to be right. <laughs> and that means not just learning about yourself, learning about society it means learning about everything because that's the point of uh, the individuals facing themselves going back to your theme song there yes is as a society we need to do this yes but it begins individually mm -hmm. it can't a it's society in, is individuals it's that song by Michael Jackson man in the mirror yes but it's also the core point, the whole point, in essence, of Persona 4. There's a part in it where the characters are put to the test, basically. Where they're given an easy answer to everything that's happened in the game so far. All the bad stuff, all the murders and attempted murders and everything. There's a guy that looks easy to blame. He probably did it. You know? And based on how he did it, the courts probably can't convict him because it sounds like a bunch of magic nonsense. That he might, you know, walk free or he might get committed for a while, you know. So why don't we take justice into our own hands? Just punish him ourselves, right? No, we, we can't do that. We don't know. Exactly. See, that's the thing, is that that point is your characters are traumatized by an event that has just happened, right? Your character, again with the spoilers, <laughs> your character's, like, basically cousin is dead right now or so you think and this guy is probably responsible for it and you have the po the moment you have a chance to make him disappear forever just gone he'll die a terrible death away from the world no one will ever know what happened to him he'll just be vanished <laughs> and it's a big point in the game because this is that easy answer. We could just believe that everything is this guy's fault, put all the blame on him, and refuse to look any farther. And all of your rational arguing to the contrary isn't going to change no. anyone's mind. No, you, you try to point out that it's ethically wrong. No, doesn't work. Oh, you're going to talk to me about ethics with someone who's a murderer and going to get away with it? Ethics has failed us. Yeah. No, you have to make the point that we don't actually know the truth. We don't know what happened. We don't know why it happened. We're missing something. 
We can't prejudge. Well, we can't condemn without knowing the truth, is the point. You can't judge without knowing the truth of somebody. You want to judge somebody based on their appearances? You don't know. You don't know what's happened. It's sort of like to take it back to my example earlier about the homeless people. Go get a job. You don't know what that person is dealing with. The people who change their minds on homelessness, tend it tends to be because of several conversations with homeless people and they find out how they got in that situation and suddenly they understand you know when you hear about somebody whose you know wife died they lost their home they lost their business their kids got taken from them literally their entire life in the span of like six months was completely dismantled and taken from them piece by piece and you're going to tell them that you know their problem with drugs and their homelessness is their fault really no no you're a fucking asshole if you do that, and you are refusing to admit the truth, that if your life was systematically taken from you and destroyed piece by piece with nothing you could do about it, that you would just cope with that? Like, no big deal? But you can't even grasp the magnitude of what an asshole you are to be so incredibly presumptuous in that situation no. because you have to protect your ego. Exactly, and let's tie this up with a bow here, huh? huh? Let's, let's take this and wrap it up, right? Because this is fundamentally not about survival. It probably once was. The ability to think things are better than they are, I could see that being very useful for a burgeoning race of people with you know higher intellects growing, but a very primitive and harsh lifestyle, right? You can see it through primitive religions. You can see it through various social aspects of early societies where they had to basically church up reality to make it worth living in for a lot of people. And, you know, maybe this stems from that. Maybe this stems from a need of our people to, at one point, believe that there's better, that there's more than what evidence suggests. But regardless, what we have now is this collective desire to ease our own burdens by simply pretending that they don't exist. And I did a video about this a long time ago, about solving your problems, you know, where... The simplest answer to a problem is to solve the fucking problem. There is no way around it. There's no easy solution. There's no silver bullet besides fixing the fucking problem at its source. You have a problem. Homelessness. You can't cart the homeless people off to another city so you don't see them. Sure, that makes you feel better, but that didn't fix the fucking problem. You can't just, like, arrest them and put them in jail because, once again, all you're doing is making them not visible. The problem exists regardless of whether you see it or not. It's a lesson that you learn, I generally think, by the age of, what, two or three object permanence? Where things that you don't see still exist unless you have seen evidence of their destruction? <laughs> it's not like, you know, it's like peekaboo. You hide yourself, you know, the baby hides their face, they think they're invisible. That's not how reality works, is that at all? That's like things that little people do who don't understand the world yet. That's what they do. <laughs> are you saying that's what we are as a society? We're infantile. We're still children, growing. We're still trying to figure out this whole cognitive thing. We're trying to figure out global existence. We're trying to figure out how not to kill each other. And we're still failing. So, we're still in our infancy. And this is a part of that. I think a part of our evolution, socially, as a society, will be casting off the masks. It will be throwing away the illusions. When we can honestly and truly look at the world and say, this is what we did with it. All right. We got to take responsibility for this. Roll up our sleeves and get to work. If we want genuine progress, we have to operate in reality. Right. It's, it's the simplest fucking thing in the world. Think about science. If you started a scientific study, right... Presuming that dogs can fly, everything that follows that statement is stupid. I don't care what you did. Because you started it on a nonsensical point that is not real. Dogs do not fly. They cannot have this ability to just fly. I mean, Thus, everything that follows that statement is wrong. Confirmation bias is a basic problem they've tried to account for in science, and they still fail even there. Right. The Stanford Prison Experiment. Yes. 
there are actually so many different studies and points where they have been discredited because of the confirmation bias informing the results. Because the author of the study and the people doing it expected a result and thus favored the outcomes that went with their expected results. They fished basically for the results that confirmed what they expected to find. And once you do that, every study can say whatever you want. Motivated reasoning. That's what I heard as a technical term for it recent, recently. When you, and I think that's the key word, motivation. When you have a right. motivation, when you have a motive behind finding an answer that is incorrect, and most people do, which is protecting their personal ego. Yes. And this manifests collectively because people don't want to admit their personal responsibility as members of the culture and its effects. Well, it's sort of the thing of, we want membership as long as it has benefits. You know how many people will call themselves something until that something gets in trouble, and then I was never a part of that. You, <laughs> To take this to a completely different nerdy point for a moment, um, tabletop gaming with, you know, dice and character sheets, all that shit. Um, one of the stereotypical bad players is the charge ahead until it fails player. <laughs> Where I'm at the front of everything, I'm charging right ahead. Oh, you triggered the trap. I was in the back of that party the whole time. Uh, no, I, I didn't do that. Me? No. I, what made you think I was in the front? The fact <laughs> that that's what you just told me, motherfucker. No, you misunderstood. You see, I meant the front of the back. No, bitch, you don't seem to understand. I'm God here. But see, that's sort of... It's that sort of revisionist reality thinking that people are sometimes aware of. In that example, generally, almost always, the player is just trying to get out of something. And so that is motivated reasoning, right? Where they're trying to find a form of logic that supports the outcome they want to see happen, deliberately. So they cherry pick what happened, they redefine words, whatever they need to in order to make what is most favorable to them have always been true from the beginning. And once you achieve that, well, you've rewritten history. And that makes it so that it seems like you were always right. <laughs> Sort of like, you know, history is written by the victors. Let's harken back to episode two for a second, talking about Indians and this Standing is Rock and Native Americans, right? The fog we've cast over our own culture about what happened to the Native American populace, right? How we will basically sort of... We will sort of now vilify ourselves as white people in the culture. It's sort of now acceptable for us to say, yeah, we screwed the natives over. I mean, this is at a point where they no longer could possibly ever regain what we've taken from them and are so far defeated at this point that they don't pose a threat. So now it's fine to admit that we fucked them. But that aside, <laughs> it sort of becomes socially acceptable for us to admit that we had nothing, you know, something to do with the destruction of their entire society. But at the same time, how many people say that and admit their personal part of that? How many people are saying that and actually thinking, I had a part of that. My family personally had a part of that. I have blood on my hands for this. No. Let's talk about the final part of this now, which is that we disassociate ourselves from society, even though we are it. Society is, to a lot of people, an amorphous, nebulous entity disconnected from us, the individual. There's society over there. What a bunch of shit, right? Society is nothing more than a bunch of people collectively acting. I'm not responsible for my actions as a member of the corporation. Right there. Corporations are just a form of that where... Diffused responsibility, and we, as a species, haven't had a conversation about how to deal with that. We haven't had a conversation about any form of diffused responsibility, really. How many governments get away with this by, well, the military did it. Are you going to arrest the whole military? You know, Congress passed this. We don't talk about this person, this person, this person, this person, this person voted for it. These people did this to make it happen. These particular names. It's Congress. The lobbyists. The group. And when you talk about the group, no longer is any person responsible for anything. 
Walmart did something. No, no, no. Walmart doesn't exist. The people that run Walmart exist. Walmart is a fictional thing that we believe in because it has signs and labels. We're doing... We're re- we're using reductionism in order to obfuscate responsibility. And that is the modern form of the fog, really. Is this idea, and it's older than time, really, in society. But it's the main form I find that it takes now when we look at economic situations. When we look at the denial of economic responsibility for wealthy people and the consequences of their disastrously bad, selfish you know, spending habits and investment habits, well, all of a sudden it's about Walmart, not about the Walton family. When they donate to charity, yeah, it's the Walton family, right? When it's a bad thing with the finances, it's Walmart because it's a shield. It's an obfuscation, a pretend logic that lets you say, well, this fictional entity that is incapable of being punished did the thing. It's like a child saying, you know, the parent comes home and there's a broken lamp on the floor. Who broke the lamp? Uh, The magic genie came through the window over there and it broke the lamp and flew away. Yeah, it's pretty stupid, right? But that's basically what they're saying. Oh, well, who's employing those child slave laborers for 25 cents a day in Africa? Hmm. Nike. Nike isn't doing that. Somebody made a decision, and people signed off on it. Nike didn't make a decision. Nike's not a thing. It's a, it's a label for a group of people that make decisions. But now you can't legally hold them responsible. All you can do is take their money small amounts of it that don't amount to much based on how much their crime is profiting. By the way, if you make a corporation diffuse responsibility and harness the fall, crime fucking pays. And now... Dollars. Like, <laughs> lots of them. You as a member of the society contribute regularly to microaggressions against multiple marginalized groups of which well, think you're about largely it like ignorant. This. And it has larger systemic effects that you get to ignore due to your privilege. You want to make this real stark for a second and kind of dark? How responsible do you think one of the uh, number crunchers for the Nazi regime feels for the prison camps that executed Jews when they were just simply calculating the numbers? They didn't kill anybody. They didn't push anybody in there. They never held a gun in their life. How? They're not responsible for what happened, are they? The fuck they aren't. It's that point of everybody that contributes to something is responsible for it. But the diffused responsibility works both ways. We ourselves can absolve ourselves of sins that we commit under the name of something bigger than ourselves. How do you think the military works? And this form is so much more insidious and pernicious because it's what allows your not your neighbors, who don't think they're Nazis, but actually are, who don't do anything in response to their Jewish neighbors being carted yeah. off, to absolve themselves of responsibility for doing nothing, which is a choice of action. Right, but they can think, I didn't do that. Did I drag them off? Did you see me point a gun at them? Did I tell the Nazis they were there? No, I didn't. I, that just happened. It's an unfortunate thing that happened. This isn't a part of my character. No, it's a disconnected event that just happened sort of like the weather. That's how people view these things, clinically and dis- detached from their guilt to it. Oh, I just watched this guy get beat. I didn't hit him. I didn't, you know, tell those guys where he was. I didn't have anything to do with that. I just watched him get beat and didn't do anything about it to stop it. So you made a choice to let him die. Yeah, let's put it that blunt for a second. By being there, the bystander watching this person get beat to death, you made a choice to let him die because you couldn't be bothered. Make all the excuses you want for it. Justify it however you want. That's the core of what this is really about. If you want to take it to fucking brass tacks, the fog is the choice to let bad things happen because you can find a justification for ignoring it. You look at homelessness and say, well... There's an organization that's giving money to homeless charities, so it's not my problem. I gave some money. I don't need to worry about this anymore. Or, yeah, sure, we're invading over there, and there's soldiers hurting people, and we're bombing weddings, but I didn't do that. I'm not piloting the drones. I didn't 
support that. No, but Thursday, of course, we all, in order to operate day to day, have to not take responsibility for all the child labor involved in producing all the clothes that we choose to wear. It's not like we could just do something about that. But see, that's the thing, is that we also tell ourselves that there's nothing we can do about things that we easily could fix if we work together. I'm powerless against the situation. It's you just the way things are. are powerless. But you know who isn't? Us. That's the thing, is that when it comes to fixing things, we suddenly view the world as, well, I'm just an individual. What, what do you expect me to do? Yet, we witness daily the power of collective effort and acknowledge it all the time. And suddenly, when it comes to doing something about it, I'm just an individual. I don't know what you expect me to do about this. That's the whole thing. I, I couldn't possibly tackle that by myself. Hold on. No one asked you to tackle it by yourself. No, we just said let's tackle it. That doesn't mean you personally confront the entire issue sword in hand and fight. That means we all have to change. Every one of us, none of us can shirk this. It's a collective effort because, well, what is society at its heart? What is a corporation at its heart? What is everything in human society, period? What, what is it at its heart? A product of people. Everything that we have in our society is a product of us. We made it. Everything that is human society is a construction that we have created in some form or another. Look at everything we call institutions from marriage to government to religion to everything. It's all things that we have manufactured for ourselves. And that means, quite obviously, that they are in our ability to change, alter, or abolish as we the collective see fit. Anything we have created, we can destroy. We can change. We can alter or abolish, however you wish to think of it. And so, the point of breaking through the fog, right? The point of overcoming all of that and facing yourself and facing society, admitting the truths, admitting where you stand in reality, your part in what happens. The point of all of that is so that, well, individually, you stand as an example. Collectively, we all learn to accept reality, which if you think about that, if we as a society made decisions based on the most obvious reality of what is happening, because again, you know, we're not perfect. Everyone can be wrong. If we but just used evidence. If we made the decision based on the preponderance of evidence, based on <coughs> the existence of what is in front of us, based on the reality as best as we can perceive it, honestly, do you think we'd be in half as much shit as we are in right now if we could make decisions based on what would actually benefit everybody, based not on our personal ideologies or egos or personal beliefs, but based on the facts that have occurred and the reality that we know is true? Because if we could do that, could you imagine if everybody, rather than saying, oh, I can dismiss this problem because of X, Y, and Z, said, I can help fix this problem by doing this thing. If everybody approached a problem like that, I can help by doing something. Everybody wouldn't have to do much, would they? No, nobody would have to do a lot, but everybody's doing something. And if everybody is doing something to help, there's already no problem most of the time. It's already been fixed. Everybody's now trying to help. And a lot of society's problems are caused by the people not trying to help. So if you just fix that, a lot of our problems would necessarily vanish or at least be ameliorated to a manageable level. Homelessness could almost vanish overnight if we had this attitude of homelessness is intolerable and we should make sure no one is homeless. For God's sake... When you wake up in the middle of the night, you can turn on your light so you know how cluttered your own room is so that you can make it to the bathroom. Or you can leave the light off because you're afraid of how cluttered your room is. You'd obviously turn on the light just so that you can clean your damn room like an adult. And that's on the most 
minor of level of things of Actually, rolling out of bed at the in the morning, much less matters of life and death. And this is you can make the simplest little changes in your own life personally, and it contributes to great things collectively. Oh yes, and see here's that a good final point I think taking it back to persona for a second right each character once they have faced themselves right once they have overcome their shadow and accepted this is a part of me this is the you know these thoughts I don't like them but I have them and I need to accept that like for an example one of the first characters who you have to deal with there's two friends right two girls they're friends um their friendship is good, but at the same time, it's based in some negative things that both of them have to confront. One of them is reliant upon the other too much, like far too much for this idea of freedom and security. Oh, you're there for me, and as long as you're there for me, it's fine. And the other one is taking a sadistic pleasure from that reliance. Oh, she needs me. That makes me powerful and important because this popular person needs me. And so that is negative, yes. I mean, they're still friends. They still do things for each other. And they're, you know, not bad for each other, but parts of their friendships are based on lies right now that they have not expressed. Once they do, though, once they admit these things, you know what happens? Their friendship becomes stronger. It improves because of the honesty that has occurred. And that is the thing is that it's like ripping off the Band-Aid, like I said so much earlier. Let's finish that analogy now because it's now time. <laughs> um, but when you rip the Band-Aid off, yeah, that hurts, right? But that's how the healing begins after the Band-Aid's been on there. You put the antiseptic cream, whatever, on there. If you leave it on there forever because you're afraid to rip it off, it eventually, the wetness in there, the moisture, creates a bad situation. It helps prevent healing and makes it worse. You rip the Band-Aid off, it hurts immediately. But then the actual final real healing process of the wound closing can begin. And that's the real thing that we want, isn't it? You don't want to put off the momentary pain of the Band-Aid in favor of a long-term infection. That is absurd if you put it in those blunt details, isn't it? I don't want the, like, you know, 30 seconds, couple minutes of pain from ripping off the Band-Aid. I'd rather have a super terrible infection later. That doesn't make any sense. Not when you put it bluntly. But you want to know the core piece of the fall? We put immense weight on the immediate and almost no weight on the future. The pain will happen right now. I don't want that right now. No, no. So future whatever is fine. Future suffering is for... To use a My Little Pony reference, that's Future Spike's problem. That's an encapsulation of that entire point. There is no future spike. That's you. There is no future you. That's you in a few minutes from now. <laughs> That's not a distinctly separate person. That is you in a few minutes from now. So pushing things into the future, avoiding them because they're going to happen right now and you're not ready for them in the moment, guess what? There's probably never going to be a better moment. There's probably never going to be the moment that you are waiting for. That's called procrastination. <laughs> and it's a cycle, and it's never-ending. It's never-ending, because guess what? The longer you don't solve the problem, the easier it is to continue not solving the problem, because it becomes a self-justification. Well, I haven't dealt with it for this long, and it hasn't killed me, so... No, but I'm also talking to people about how I'm solving the problem. Ah, uh, yes. The idea... There's another insidious piece of the fog before we... I keep saying before we close and keep going, but, you know, whatever. Um, it's that point that we can often deceive ourselves into thinking we've faced it. That, oh yeah, I'm doing something about this. I'm talking about it. I'm just, I'm talking to people about my problems, right? I still drink as much as I ever did, but I'm talking to people about my problems. Then you're not actually really facing them. Like, there's that point where you can convince yourself you're doing something about it. Well, you know, I, I joined a Facebook group. I posted about it. And <laughs> that's the point, is that you can admit to a problem and think you're fixing it. 
when you're not really doing anything about it that is impactful. We're prone to catharsis instead. Yes. Look for impact, not feeling. See, that's the thing is we lead ourselves astray all the time. That's where the fog comes from is us leading ourselves astray based on our feelings. And it's that prioritizing ourselves over the collective. It's like, you know, it starts, the change starts with us. But the point is to affect those bigger changes exactly. that are beneficial to all of us because of our collective action, because we're interdependent, not independent. It begins with an individual, but the point is not to affect the individual, but to affect the collective. And that collective is something that every individual is a part of. Exactly. It's collective action for individual benefits, but collective benefit as well. Well, it's everyone's benefit. That's the thing is that at bo- the that's end... The, that's the, actually kind of the point is that... The distinction is fallacious. Exactly, because society is us. Every one of us is society. It's like trying to differentiate a single cell from the human body. You could do it. The single cell, though, is pointless by itself. A skin cell. What the fuck ever, right? A person is, though, nothing more than a collection of various differentiated cells. Yet, collectively together, they're a human being. A blood cell is pointless by itself. It will die. Just like any other individual. A liver cell. Who cares? Like, But a person is a whole distinct, complete thing that is capable of independent survival, motion, and everything. But it needs each of those individual needs, parts like the blood exactly. cell. Without those blood cells, you're dead. Without those liver cells, you're dead. Without any of it, you're fucking dead. Each of those individual pieces is useless by itself. It only has any use or utility inside of that system. Exactly. And that is society right there. It is the collective individuals creating something more. And so that does mean, though, that the individuals comprising it can alter it for better and for worse. We believe lies. We believe things that are comfortable but untrue. Society begins to do that. Society operates under things that are untrue, beliefs that are false. The media, popular myths. Yes, And it's sort of like a preview for a video I want to cover at some point, but I'll go ahead and talk about some of it, is this idea that we see the collective game of telephone, basically, with our beliefs about things. It's how urban legends and modern myths and everything begin. You ever seen Creepypasta? It's that whole idea that through the telling of something, the truth can be easily lost and replaced with the feeling behind it. Someone says, you had a good example for it. You know, someone first starts with, um... Oh, it was ghastly. Yeah. And then suddenly the word, the use of the word ghastly turns into, oh, there was, uh, it felt like there was a ghost there. Turns into, there was a ghost. Exactly. And suddenly, by that time, so many people have heard it that it's now a ghost story. The original story has basically been lost. And suddenly you have this idea propagated by, you know, let's look at the 1980s real quick. The Satan panic. (laughs) The satanic panic, right? Where because of really nothing more than gossip and speculation and rumor, there was suddenly this idea that there was an entire underground satanic community molesting and torturing children and passing out tainted Halloween candy and everything else literally you can think of. Oh, and we're going to make up the evidence to support this by encouraging the kids to testify the way that we want them to. Well, it wasn't even that we were trying to make up the evidence for it. We already thought we knew what had happened. There obviously were Satanists molesting children. So why don't you, child, tell us how they touched you? That's how they start. Not with, did they? No. Tell us what they did. <laughs> it's like if you find a kid, right? And he was lost for three days, right? And you start off with, who kidnapped you? Versus, what happened to you, right? We know that subtle word usage changes people's perceptions and memories of events. Yeah. That's how malleable we are as people. And that's another thing about this to remember about the fog is it's part of the air we breathe. It's completely unnoticeable to most of us. Because it's just repeated as true. It's just said. 
with absolute authority and conviction by See, lots of people. It's so easy to believe because it's what everyone else around you believes. It's like the get a job thing. Homeless people just get a job. People say it. It's a meme. It's a common thing people just say, right? Get a job. It's something you see a lot of, oh, the, the douchebag in the movie, he told that homeless guy to get a job. It's sort of like one of those red flag things even. It's a cultural meme at this point that we're starting to accept that that might not be true. But here's that final piece of the fog, the echo chamber. Us on the side of right, right, whoever you think you are, it is very easy to listen to other people echo what you think is right and suddenly think the world has listened and is changing. And then all of a sudden you have a Trump moment when you're like, but I thought we had made progress. And you suddenly then realize you were talking to about 20% of the population and listening to the echoes. The rest of them aren't on board. And that is one of the easiest traps to fall into because you started facing yourself. You started doing this. You think you're affecting change, but you're still not actually being honest with yourself. You're still listening to the people that agree with you. You're still being a part of the problem, surprisingly, and most likely unintentionally. But yet, it's that thing where you have to always keep in mind the reality, not just of your reality, but of other people's reality, to get meta for a moment, right? You can't just think about, this is how reality is, and because I know this is how reality is, people should just accept that. Well, they don't have to. That's the point of the fog of lies. They're given an alternative to accepting reality, and it's right there. So to simply sit there and say, this is the truth, so I have done my job, is false because just because you have the truth doesn't mean anyone has to listen to it you have to make the case for it you have to fight the fog because it offers an easy guilt-free alternative to reality that's what you're up against if you want to fight this is that easy guilt-free alternative to thinking objectively and it's not an easy thing to beat. you have to tell people no no you actually are complacent in this bad thing you have to accept some guilt for this and you have to change behaviors versus the fog over here going no no that's over there child laborers they're in cambodia or whatever that's not even like here and how could you even be involved in that like really that's all the way over that how that that doesn't make any sense and so yeah you have to fight that. You have to, if you want to be a voice of truth, you have to fight it not only in other people, but yourself. You have to sit there and say, well, I hear a bunch of people agreeing with me. That's good, but is that everybody? Does that is that really what's happening? Let me investigate myself now and my own people and see what am I representing and who's really here. Every step of the way, it's checking yourself and saying, you know, let me think about what I'm doing. Is this still right? Is this still okay? Let me reevaluate this again. Because you never can stop checking yourself and attempting to be more correct and being more aligned with what is true. Because, well, deviacy from truth is easy for society. It's easy for humans and individuals. It's easy for everybody to, at any point, simply hear something that they agree with and just let that be true. And so if you're going to take any lesson from this today, right, if you're going to take anything from this, if you had to just take one thing, it would be every step of the way, double check what you're learning. Look at the fake news crisis now. Just check your sources. Make your opposition who makes claims cite their sources. Unless they're making, you know, of course, that obvious. If somebody says, you know, this is obviously evidenced, you can spare a Google search. Do your own research, too. It's on you as well as everybody else. Because remember, the fog is pervasive. Telling other people to do the research doesn't mean you'll get the factual information. <laughs> do your own damn research as well as other people's research. <laughs> I was thinking, uh, personally, a lot of what you just said uh, speaks to me and will be something I have to take to heart uh, when it comes to the way I've been personally addressing things a lot recently. Um, and that's the thing. Try and learn something new every day. Yes. That kind of shit, you know? But I think that's about it. An episode. Yeah. So, 
Everybody, we still don't have a Patreon set up for Thursday. So, um, but thank you for coming and listening. And until next week. We still don't have a tagline. Suggest down in the comments. What do you yeah. like? Good opener, end line for this kind of thing. Like, uh, what are your thoughts?